Attacks on schools are among some of the most devastating and senseless acts there are. And while disasters like Sandy Hook and Columbine are well documented, the story of one of the United States' most deadly school massacres has largely been forgotten. Today, we look back at the Bath School disaster of 1927. Located a few miles away from Lansing, the capital of Michigan, Bath Township today has a population of more than 11,500. But in 1927, it was nothing more than a small rural village that housed only a few hundred people. One of its main features was the three-story Bath Consolidated School, which had 314 students, despite having been built only five years earlier. Most of the students were the sons and daughters of farmers who lived in the region. They were bussed in every morning and after graduating from high school, either went to work on their family's lands or moved to the city in search of better opportunities. A simple tale retold across the states of those trying to live their own versions of the American dream. But all that would come to a tragic end on May the 18th, 1927. It was the last day of the school year with students paying more attention to the clock than what their teachers were saying as they eagerly awaited the start of their summer vacation. At 8.45 a.m. though, their morning lessons were suddenly interrupted by an explosion so powerful it was reportedly heard several miles away. Immediately after the explosion, the roof of the building's north wing collapsed, burying the students and teachers who were inside. Bystanders rushed forward to pull people out from the rubble, while others called for ropes so that the larger pieces of debris could be lifted. Descriptions of the bombing's aftermath are harrowing, to say the least. According to local author Monty J. Ellsworth, who wrote the Bath School Disaster, quote, There was a pile of children, about five or six, under the roof, and some of them had arms sticking out. Some had legs and some just their heads sticking out. They were unrecognizable because they were covered with dust, plaster, and blood. It is a miracle that many parents didn't lose their minds before the task of getting their children out of the ruins was completed." End quote. Meanwhile, author Arnie Bernstein, who wrote Bath Massacre, America's first school bombing, said, quote, Inside the school was just as awful as awful can be. There was one teacher whose head was wedged between two boards. She couldn't move just hoping to be rescued. There was a boy in front of her. They were almost face to face. The kid's eyes were open and she realized the kid was dead. Some people were identifying their children by their shoes." End quote. Shortly after the explosion, the authorities arrived at the site and began their investigations, hoping to figure out what had caused the blast. What they discovered was chilling. This was no accident. They found that hundreds of pounds of explosives had been planted and detonated. They found another 500 pounds of unexploded dynamite and pyrotol, an explosive reprocessed from military surplus, had been placed in the basement along with a huge container of gasoline, which they assumed was a backup plan in case the dynamite failed. Had these detonated, the explosion would have been even more deadly. While the investigation and rescue efforts were underway, a member of the Bath Consolidated School Board named Andrew Kehoe also arrived at the scene with a truck. Many assumed that he was there to help, but they couldn't have been more wrong. He saw Superintendent Emery E. Hoek and beckoned him over. Witnesses later reported that the pair then began to struggle with some sort of long gun before Kehoe did something unthinkable. Unbeknownst to anyone but himself, he had filled his car with dynamite and shrapnel. During the struggle, Kehoe managed to detonate these explosives, killing himself, Hike, and several others instantly. One of those lost in the second bombing was second grader Cleo Clayton, who had survived the first blast only to sadly perish as the car exploded. A total of 43 people lost their lives in the Bath School explosion. Of these, 38 were children, ages 8 to 14, who were buried alive when the roof collapsed on them. 
also amongst those who died were two elementary teachers, Blanche Hart and Hazel Weatherby. In a recent interview, author Harold Schechter described the tragedy as, quote, a unique case in our history. I say it was the deadliest school massacre in our history, which it was, but it was also the only one, as far as I'm aware, that was committed with explosives. Kehoe really intended to murder every child in the community. I mean, if all the explosive he planted had actually detonated, he would have killed an entire generation of children in that community. It was a crime of such monstrous proportions that there really hasn't been anything quite like it." End quote. Andrew Kehoe and his wife, Nellie, were well known in the tight-knit Bath community. He was an electrician and had purchased surplus wartime explosives from the government to help local farmers remove unwanted tree stumps. He was also active on the school board, where he held the position of treasurer. Kehoe may have been active in the community. However, residents recalled him being hot-tempered and overly aggressive at times. For instance, he reportedly killed a neighbor's dog and was said to have beaten one of his horses to death. He had also gotten into a fierce argument with other members of the school board shortly before the explosion and was said to rant and rave at meetings. Most of these ravings were about taxes. Three townships had clubbed together to build the school, with residents agreeing to a tax to pay for it. Kehoe and his wife had no children, and so he vehemently fought against paying the tax. According to author Harold Schechter, quote, he was somebody who, in the spring of 1927, had descended into paranoia and basically had come to believe that his life had been destroyed financially and, in other ways, by his townspeople. They had voted to construct a very expensive, new, modern, consolidated school, and Kehoe, in the spring of 1927, very diabolically set out to take his revenge on the community by blowing up the school on the last day of the school year." End quote. The authorities already considered Kehoe as primary suspect, given that he had detonated a truck full of explosive on the site. However, an investigation on his farm confirmed their suspicions. At the back of the farm, they found the decaying corpse of his wife, Nellie, lying beside boxes that contained silverware, liberty bonds, and cash. She appeared to have been murdered only a day or so before the explosion. Along with these discoveries, they also found a sign reading, criminals, a maid not born, attached to a fence surrounding the property. Kehoe's farm was virtually destroyed, with the evidence suggesting that he had firebombed it shortly before driving to the school and detonating the dynamite in his car. Besides his wife, all his horses had also been burned to death. Wires around their legs suggested that Kehoe had tied them up to ensure that they wouldn't escape the flames. Many believed that the bombing had been planned at least nine months before it actually happened, which was around the time of the town's election season. Kehoe had put up a fierce campaign to secure the position of township clerk, a position he had been occupying temporarily, but ultimately failed. Instead of accepting the fact he had lost the election, he took the voters' failure to elect him as a personal attack and instantly bore a grudge against his townsfolk. He set about getting his supposed revenge nearly immediately. He bought boxes of explosives and dynamite, something that wouldn't be seen as unusual for a farm owner to do, as these would often be used to clear tree stumps. To obfuscate the amount he was buying and avoid suspicion, Kehoe would make his purchases from several different stores. It's also believed that he stole large amounts of dynamite from a nearby bridge construction site. It seems that this need for revenge had consumed him entirely. A neighbor states that he stopped working on his farm soon after the election, and investigators discovered that he had destroyed crops, cut holes in wire fences, and blew up tools and timber, gaining the nickname of the dynamite farmer amongst those living nearby. 
Because he was a proficient electrician and because they had no way of knowing the hatred he held for them, the school board hired Keyhole to conduct repairs on the building's lighting system in mid-1926. This gave him unfettered access and ample opportunity to conduct his awful plan. Ida Hall, a woman who lived nearby the school, noticed someone making regular visits to the building late at night, carrying large boxes inside on several occasions. She mentioned this to a relative, but nothing came of it. Through much of his preparations, his wife Nellie had been ill in hospital suffering from what was thought to be tuberculosis. She was released home on the 16th of May and murdered by Andrew sometime between then and when his horrific plan was put into action two days later. Given that the victims consisted mostly of children, the Bath school disaster unsurprisingly drew a ton of media attention. Reporters tried to make sense of the tragedy, with many alleging that Keyhole was mentally ill. For instance, a report published by the New York Times read, quote, Kehoe was notified last June that the mortgage on his farm would be foreclosed, and that may have been the circumstances that started the clockwork of anarchy and madness in his brain." End quote. Meanwhile, an article from the Boston Daily Globe stated that two head injuries Kehoe had reportedly sustained had disturbed his state of mind, leading him to bombing the school. The media's sentiments weren't shared by the local authorities, though. According to Arnie Bernstein, the author of Bath Massacre, America's First School Bombing, quote, at the conclusion of the inquest, it says he was of rational mind the whole time. It does take a rational mind to plan all that out. The reality is, there's no why, end quote. For the local authorities, Kehoe wasn't insane simply because his crime was incredibly complicated. Not only did he properly wire hundreds of pounds of explosives, but he also created a backup plan in case the original one failed. Many in Bath believed that only a rational mind could have pulled this off. However, others believed that Kehoe was nothing more than a psychopath who wanted to massacre an entire generation of townspeople. In fact, he reportedly fits all the attributes of the psychopathy checklist, a set of criteria created by the Canadian criminal psychologist Robert Hare that includes items like a grandiose sense of self-worth, manipulativeness, and cunningness. Andrew Kehoe was said to have exhibited all these. Thanks to the media's coverage of the disaster, volunteers flocked to Bath in the weeks following the bombing, offering to help out wherever they were needed. Even politicians lent a hand, with Senator James Cousins sending $75,000 to help rebuild the school. When the new building was finished, it was renamed the James Cousins Agriculture School in his honor. As tragic as the Bath school disaster was, it didn't hold the public's attention for long. Two days after it happened, the famed aviator Charles Lindbergh, who would of course go on to suffer his own tragedy, made the world's first ever non-stop transatlantic flight, which pushed the bombing out of the headlines. In 1975, the schoolhouse was torn down and replaced with a memorial park, which now houses the school's original cupola. While physical remnants of the disaster are no longer there, its ghosts continue to linger. Many of the town's residents grew up knowing that the name Keyhole meant pure evil. The survivors of the blast also remain haunted by the traumatic experience. Martha Horton, who was trapped on the second floor of the school when the explosion happened, recalled, quote, We were sort of raised out of our seats. The pastor came down and then we were panicked. In most cases, we remember our fallen soldiers. We should remember these children who were so innocent and had to die that way." End quote. A fellow schoolmate said, quote, We still look at ourselves as survivors. So you look after one another differently because you know that the absolute unthinkable can happen, even going to school. End quote. A very tragic case. I'd like to thank you for watching and to remind you also to take care. And I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, 
Well, I never.